Welcome to another episode of Reminiscences, uh, where we engage senior citizens on their experiences in life uh, so that we, the younger ones, can learn something from it. Today is my pleasure to welcome you to the home of uh, Chief Philip Aseodu in Victoria Island, Lagos, where we will spend some time talking to him about the past and something of the present. Uh, the older viewers will recall him uh, in, uh, as one of the super permanent secretaries. There were a bunch of them then after 19, the civil war of the 1970s, who were basically running the country under the first uh, military government. Um, uh, you recall names like Alison Aida, Ahmed Jorda, and many others who perhaps he will help us to recall. So I'd like to st start, sir, by asking you, who were the permanent secretaries and where, why were they so called? Well, the permanent secretaries were a great, uh, great in the administrative civil service cadre. They were supposed to be the coordinators of ministries and all the ministerial advice to the minister leading to council memoranda which went to the government and was approved. It was coordinated by the permanent secretary. When they moved from the pre-colonial government where you have executive council members who were only civil servants to when we now had responsible government, council of ministers, and in the federal government, because the first prime minister was Balewa, you know, and he, Tafawa Balewa, and at that time, they got people from England to advise on the transition to ministerial governments with the PAMSEC as the coordinator of all advice to the minister. You know, in those days, in departments like health, works, and justice, the, and this happened even after the coordination, the Solicitor General in the Ministry of Justice remained, he was Permanent Secretary and Solicitor General. In the Ministry of Works, you had Permanent Secretary, but you had a Director of Ministry whose salary was a bit higher than that of the PAMSEC. And also in the Ministry of Health, you had a Chief medical advisor, whose salary was a bit higher than the permanent secretary. But even where the salaries were higher, the administrative officer who was permanent secretary, whose job had been across all the sectors and divisions, a generalist, he had to coordinate submissions from all these specialist sectors to the minister. And so you had that arrangement. And this was, they brought somebody called Nunes from the British Civil Service who finalized the report in which we now transited from residents in the provinces and governor, deputy governors and uh, Chief, uh, Chief, uh, I've forgotten his, his name, but there was a chief administrative officer in Lagos. And of course, in the provinces, you had the residents reporting to the deputy governor general and 
before then the lieutenant governors. But how, now, how did you acquire the the subrocate super permanent secretary? This super and, uh, yes permanent uh, uh, this was after the military coup of 19 January 1966. You know, they wanted to be permanent secretaries. They wanted permanent secretaries to become ministers. And we said, no, you are not there permanently. So we can't be. In fact, we kept advising, even from January. It's better you bring in known political leaders in Nigeria, whether it has been a coup or not, to advise the world will take us more serious. Now, Iran C didn't implement that, and there was the counter coup, in which he was assassinated and replaced by Gawan. Even under Gawan, we maintained the same advice, but it was only until later. Now, under Gawan, we found that he was a very good man, very careful, listen to people, but sometimes we felt that decisions were not quick in coming. And we had sworn the oath. I, for instance, became permanent secretary under Balewa. When there were more senior permanent secretaries, like Abdul Aziz Atta, Ejwechi, Siu Lawson, Tukumbo, and all that, Ani, you know. But some of us felt that, although we had been brought up in the tradition that you gave advice, non-partisan advice, secretly to the minister. And then when the minister had agreed what he wanted to do, you produced the memorandum, which he took to cabinet and became policy. But when there were no more ministers, who were coming on the back of canvassed ideas on which they were elected, we felt there was something missing in terms of policy formulation. And then when Ironsi left, I mean was removed, Gawan came on, very good man, listened properly, but we felt that with the crisis escalating, there were some decisions which had to be taken. And so beyond our normal duties of giving advice to ministers, there were no ministers, there was just Supreme Military Council, and permanent secretaries were now to present memoranda and papers to the Supreme Military Council, decisions were taken, and permanent secretaries had as before to implement them. We felt that in duty to the country, in truth to our oath, to have the country preserved, to have the company functioning, that beyond our normal duties, if things were really going bad, we should meet together, formulate some suggestions, and try whether he asked for it or not, <laughs> to request to see the head of government, present these things to him, and if he agreed, he would give instructions that would be government policy. Now there were some older permanent secretaries, as I said, like Lawson and uh, Abdul Aziz Atta, and people like Tokumbo, Eme Tokumbo, and Emoani, who didn't think this was the function of permanent sectors. But a few of us thought, we can't allow the country. We had sworn to protect Nigeria, preserve its unity, assure its good governance. In truth to our oath, we must do something. And so a few of us would gather, formulate ideas, and go to the head of service and say, look, we can't continue this way. We must get the head of government to take a decision. This is after the Civil War? Uh, no, no, before the Civil War, when no. the crisis 
was discovered after mm. the second coup mm. with Gawan now yeah. as head of the federal military government, uh, supreme commander, if you like, mm. and head chairman of the Supreme Military Council, where the governors came mm. and the one or two senior and decisions were taken, binding on the country. Mm. Now, because of that, now the, the head of the civil service, secretary to the government, Ejoichi, saw the importance of this and allowed us to present things to him. And he would then arrange for us to go with him and meet Gawan and decisions will be taken government policies will be formulated and implemented. Now, when, after the Civil War was won and he stepped down, retired, he was succeeded by Abdul Aziz Atta, who at first thought things were like under Balawa. Once you formulate your policies, you wait for the head of government to take a decision. I think he found that decisions were not forthcoming and it was big enough and wise enough to allow what they as senior commanders didn't like before this pressure group of permanent secretaries coming and saying a b c d this should be done and so under him we continued the process of going to general gawan and saying please Action must be taken on A, B, C, D. These are the recommendations. You now, it is that group mm. which became super. known as super permanent secretaries. Mm. And also, during when this crisis now escalated into civil war, about three of us, late Ahmed Joda, late Alice Naida and myself, would travel more than 10,000 miles every month, going abroad, trying to explain what the federal government was about, that this, not, this was not a war of Christians versus Muslims, of Muslim dervishes against Christians, and what it meant preserving Nigerian unity, and what the consequences would be if it wasn't. It is those which led, not in admiration, more in criticism to the media inventing the phrase super permanent secretaries. But later on, it became a bit more positive. Tell me why you couldn't help Kawan? I mean, after the civil war, things settled down. There was an oil boom, a lot of money to spend. But then the government floundered and was thrown out in, in a coup. Well, the, in, 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 in all fairness, the civil service under Gawan was allowed to function with all its powers and prestige. And in fact, if you bear in mind, that before the civil war, the Nigerian army was only 10,000 people. It was the civil service that was able to organize the logistics and support to enable an army of 10,000 to grow to 250,000 in order to successfully conduct the civil war. Mm. It was the civil service which was able to do this without the need to borrow and be frustrated. Because if you disintegrate, the, the outside world will say, fine, it's not their business to enable a black country to become globally significant. It was on the way, who was, who after the second coup was obliged to retire as secretary to the government, which he then succeeded him. But he was a special uh, commissioner in charge of coordinating the railways. And we were able in 66, 67, 68, 
69, every year to transport about 1.5 million tons of agricultural produce for export, with which we helped to finance the war without borrowing. So the civil service under Gawan was functioning. So in, in many ways, it wasn't that they were, but they were not. And we kept urging them that, look, this is not our function to take memos to council, Supreme Military Council, have them approved, then have to explain what used to be done by ministers. Memos were debated in parliament, and parliament took decisions on the basis of which bills became acts, and the minister explained. But it was a business as permanent secretary to coordinate all the information and enable them to explain. And they too had political parties which explained to the people, this is what we want to do. Now, under the military regime, that ceased to be so. And permanent sectors became more prominent and attracted all the criticism. First, from the politicians who thought that it's the civil servants supporting the army to prevent them from ruling the country. The media, for one reason or the other, thought permanent sectors had become a bit too powerful, invented this <laughs> pejorative, <laughs> but later on positive, mm. super permanent sectors. That is why when the coup now happened on against Gawan, the, the, civil, coup. the civil service was severely dealt with, and we're still suffering yeah, before we get to that, yes. the, the, one of the criticism against th that period, that cadre of civil service, yes. is the mismanagement of the oil boom. Indeed, there was this notion that the country had too much money to spend and didn't know how to spend it. That is purely untrue. <laughs> because one of the justification, which justifications mm. which Gawan gave and this had nothing to do with the civil service, for postponing the date when we were, it was supposed to hand over to civilians was that they wanted to implement the 1975 to 1970, 1980 plan. But you will see, instead of out of the three regions, just before the war, before the civil war, the Juku secession, now, in the 75 to 80 plan, which would have initiated the transformation of Nigeria, we now moved on to have the industrial sector move from assembly type industries to industries based on primary capital and intermediate goods production. We moved to the point of from trees to pulp to paper. We talked about cassava or maize, starch, glucose. And you know cassava, is cassava 30% of it is starch. And starch is used for textile industry. It's used, you know, for explosives. It is such a thing, so productive. And when you get to glucose, then you talk about intravenous fluids, and you, then you can react it with enzymes to MSG. Then we talked about, even under Balewa, Nigeria was self-sufficient as far as petroleum products was concerned. And we planned not only to be self-sufficient, but to start exporting. We have even had a company, which Duke Petroleum, which by 1981 was exporting. So, and you will see that in the introduction to the 1975-80 plan, clearly stated 
that oil is a wasting asset because oil will run out and that the importance was to use the windfall of oil revenues to make sure that renewable, sustainable industries were established. And you will see that the first priority in the 1975-80 plan, as in the 1970-74 uh, uh, plan, was agro-allied industries. And this is still our first priority. There is no state in Nigeria which doesn't produce agricultural goods, which if properly processed to the point that it can be sold internationally, would not generate enough jobs and taxable individuals to make the state sustainable. All these were in the plan. And you remember that even during the Civil War, in 1969, we had a conference in which we had all the Nigerians, ex-politicians, journalists, students, civil servants, politicians, people from abroad, under the chairmanship of Simeon Adebo, who was a permanent representative, where we elaborated what went into the 70-74 plans. And not only that, from 1970, at the end of the Civil War, till 1975, when they did the coup against Gawan, the Nigerian economy was growing at per annum average of 11.75% per annum. Ten more years of that, Nigeria would have exited from poverty. Your career yes. seemed to have stopped from 75 as a civil servant. Yes. And, and, and the system, you, 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 you criticize the system, that it's been destroyed and disrupted. Yes, yes. What, what, what uh, is, is this a personal thing no, it you isn't. do? Or is it really a systematic? It isn't, uh, because what happened was that they decided to attack the civil service and all the other This is the military, right? All that public service. The, the, mili the military. That, under that coup. Yes. The first two military regimes, the Ronsi and all and Gawan, did not attack yes. the civil service. So it's Murtala now. And ten thousand people were retired in two months. With immediate effect. Including you. Including me. I was number one civilian to go. Mm -hmm. But in fairness, even though I was retired before they started announcing. They came to my place. I was then in Southwest Ikoye. I'd moved out of government quarters. Luckily, I had built a bungalow in, in the previous regime. So, and said, nothing against you, but you can't fit into the new image of palm sex. And two weeks later, they started announcing this thing. Well, you people speak much better English than myself. But I've never been able to understand the phrase <laughs> retired with immediate effect and increasing alacrity. <laughs> you people can ex explain that. No, no. But it I, must have sounded I, nice. I, I, think, I think they were in a hurry yes. to reform, but to that, changes. That, and and you, you seem to think that this is... This no, is but what, what did you conceive as a change? Was it conceived properly? Was it... And when you change, did you have a vision and a program what you were changing? This is what went wrong. And instead of we've changed, this is our program, and so forth and so on, it now became people behaving with impunity. And when you abandon the discipline of planning, whether it's public or private sector, where you say beforehand, this is what we want to achieve. And if we get this money, this is what we'll spend it on. Money will come and money will go. And this is precisely what happened. When I was in charge of the oil ministry, we were talking about $3, $20 per barrel. You know, it then, after the oil crisis, increased to about 11 
and so forth and so on. And after 1999-2000 increased to what we now talk about, you know. But as I told you, even at that time, we identified that oil revenues will not be with us forever. And we must use it to create the basis of renewable industrialization. And that was the basis on which the second, the, the uh, fourth plan, 1970 to 74, was designed. And 1975 to 1980. Now, so what happened was this wishing not to be restrained. Because some of us used to be saluted by some of them who took over 1975. When they were junior officers, they didn't want people to say, you can't do this. So I remember, for instance, after the crisis of the 1964, post-1964 election, and they settled on broad-based government, I had quickly, as acting PAMSEC, to excise the industry section from commerce and industry into a separate ministry. And that separate ministry, because of broad-based arrangement, had the minister, Akinloye, minister of state of cabinet rank, H.O. Davis, who left King's College before I was born, and um, Victor Adele and one other person, two ministers of state of non cabinet rank and a parliamentary secretary, had to find offices from what was a small sec a, sm a section of the Ministry of Mines and Power. Luckily for me, the minister, Iogu, I mean, the permanent secretary, Ministry of Finance, Iogu, was a friend. And he was able to help us provide funds. And I was able to create good office for the minister and a good enough office for the minister of state cabinet rank and an office for the permanent secretary, which was the really where work had to be done. But there was only one other office in which you could put a minister of state. And of course, we have found one office for the parliamentary secretary. In those days, we used to work six days a week, Monday to Saturday. So what was that to do? Only one office suitable for minister of state until we get some more accommodation. And I recommended, and it was accepted, that the main two ministers of state of non-cabinet rank, we use that one office. One of them will come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the other Tuesday, <laughs> Thursday, this thing. Can you imagine that now? <laughs> it was accepted. Not only that, Akinluye, the minister, now asked me to do a schedule of duties. I was a young permanent secretary. Schedule of duties is to show you the relationship between the political class and the minister. Schedule of duties for all the ministers, which I did, and they accepted. Can you imagine that today? It's difficult to imagine, but uh, let, let, yes. me, let me go to the period then from 75. Yes. Here you were in your early 40s. Yes. Essentially now cashiered from the civil service. Yes. So what was life for you from that point? No, this is the pity. As I told you, I was in the foreign service quite abroad in New York when they were doing ballot for plots in Southwest Ikoi. I wasn't in Lagos, but our colleagues, things were disciplined at that time, sent the papers to us. And I filled in my name. And that was the one ballot I ever succeeded. You know, I got a plot. And this plot was one of the bigger ones in Southwest Ikoi and in a corner. And that was 1961. And I didn't come back to Lagos in 1963. But nobody took the plot. Nobody changed it. Can you imagine that these days? And I came back. 
the plot was given to me, fine. And in those days, you know, soon I became Deputy PAMSEC, Ministry of Lagos Affairs. And so one of the board members of the African Loan Scheme. So it was impossible. I mean, it was possible. I could still have qualified for a loan. But today I'll be explaining to you I didn't give myself a loan. Or even not today. When there was the probe pro in 1977 or 76. But you could borrow money from the bank, do the foundation, and then you could commercially get a loan for 12.5% to build, which I did. So, so you had a house? So, but this, what, what else were you doing after? So, you, luckily, yeah. I had a house I could move into. Yeah. Now, I was just explaining this to you because there were people who had been working honestly in the civil service, looking forward to before they retire, they would have built a house. Suddenly, mm -hmm. with immediate effect, their names announced. Their children were in school in Ikoyi, in Corona. They had to find plots, houses in uh, distant places, Kocha or beyond the Koka and all that, and drive. Luckily for me, even if I didn't have that house in Ikoyi, my father had two houses in Yaba. They had been in civil service, in customs, which I could have gone, put air conditioning in one or two rooms. It wouldn't have been as bad. So you saw the agony mm. of those people. And then they will sit side by side with not so honest civil servants whose generators will be making noise. And the wife will say, aren't you the same rank as that person? Seven out of 10 people will succumb. Especially when after 75, there was no longer that monitoring process where the head of the department looked at the way his subordinates were spending money. And if he thought it was beyond their salary, he would call them to explain. If he was not satisfied, he would set up a tribunal of inquiry. So there was that continuous processing and monitoring. And if he wasn't satisfied, set up the tribunal, sanctions would be employed. But once you've now imposed a regime of impunity on the service, you can't report erring subordinates to anybody. That led to the increasing corruption from which the country is now threatened. Now, to push this point clearer, in 1958, I was in the Federal Secretary there was somebody promoted from, you know, in those days, can be promoted from chief clerk to branch B, senior service. And once you were promoted senior service, you were automatically entitled to car loan. You get it, you apply, this thing. This man had been working, and we used to retire at 55. This man had been working for more than 30 years. He was now 52. He was promoted. So he, automatic car loan, he applied. He was given. But his friends told him, so, so you drive a car for two years. What is that? Why don't you complete your house? So he got car loan, but he completed his house. But because you had car loan, they were crediting you with motor basic allowance, which was to enable us to maintain our cars. Now, you got car loan, you didn't buy car. You didn't buy car, you were taking motor basic allowance. So people started to talk. It got to the ear of the head of department, who now summoned. The laws are still there, but you know how we do with laws now, completely lawless. Now, so he summoned a transition, I mean a, tribun a tribunal to investigate. The tribunal will investigate. You got the car loan, you didn't buy a car. Transcription, you know, you 
transgression. Mm. Two, you didn't have car. You were being credited with motor basic. You didn't say no. You'll be found guilty. If he was found guilty, if he was lucky, they will say termination of appointment, which would still entitle him to pension, but no gratuity. If he was not so lucky, which was more likely, to be dismissal, no gratuity, no pension after 32 years. But you don't try dead men on the eve of the tribunal meeting committed suicide. Mm -mm. Can you imagine it today? He will take some women in Ashwabi uniform to demonstrate his political enemies mm -hmm. made him. Two, if like uh, one of the ex governors, he was taken to the tribunal, he will collect <laughs> about 10 or 7, mm -hmm. 20 SNs and women in uniform to say, if unfortunately he was jailed, like happened to one of them, the day is being released, he will get these people to, to welcome him, and then he will find one or two archbishops and do Thanksgiving service. <laughs> that is the degradation. So but let's, because of that, yeah. the man committed suicide. So I'm just telling you how yeah. things were. Those laws still exist. But because of this impunity mm. in 75, first, you remember, over 10,000 people retired with immediate effect, some, you know. Later on, they set up a group under Pedro Martins, who was a chaplain in the army, who found that more than 95% of those people should never have been retired. And in fact, some of them were being recommended for promotion. Some had finished international courses, because we had to have courses in those days before you move from stage to stage. So this is what led to the destruction of the processes by which you checked corruption and led us to where we are. So, so the people who should have been telling ministers, look here, this is the council conclusion. This is the financial instruction. We can't do this. We're not there. So, but, so are we saying that because of the 75 events, Nigeria could not sh I mean, shake out of this issue of corruption? No, is, is this the same it, thing holding us back? I said that, what are there? that in fact destroyed all the restraints. Because if, if human beings are what they are, if there is clear sanctions, many people will behave. You remember when under the military administration of Buhari, they said queuing up. When Nigerians queuing up, because they knew there was a major general at that time mm. with uh, Koboko, who will lash you, you know. Once there are sanctions being applied without discrimination, people will perform. If there are no such sanctions, seven out of 10 people with this, thing, especially if people were benefiting. And we have had more than 40 years of this degradation. So it's very serious and we must get out of it. And I've made some private and public recommendations. You know, that's one. So can, can, we, can we get you a solution? to how we can get out. A lot of people are talking about you have to structure the country, you have to do this. When you, what is your own? When you do? ask them about restructure, what do they mean? Do they say the same thing? Some are talking about using the zones as the pillars of the federation. Yes. How many governors are going to agree? Six governors per zone five in Southeast, that you now lose their powers. Others are talking about devolution. But I'm of the opinion, when you ask the average man, what does he really want? 
Hmm? He wants food, food security. He wants shelter. He wants possibility for his children to go to school and be better. And he wants good health programs. Anybody who can deliver that to you, you are not bothered where he came from. The tragedy was that that coup of 1975 prevented us implementing successfully the universal basic education, which we had started by saying build schools, build train teachers and all that. Because the destruction of the civil service, you remember that it was one northern service based in Kaduna divided into six when six states were created in the northern region and in the east into three and the west into three or two with Midwest having been created. Now you were asking them to bring lists of people to be retired. So we didn't have civil service able to insist with their milit political or military superiors that we continue with that program. But Obasanjo continued UBE. He introduced, Obasanjo introduced UBE. In the Basel, uh, that's what I'm the, saying, the, the that they did it without... You, you have it was to not train the teachers, you have to build the schools. And my late friend Joda, as PAMSEC education, wasn't able. He kept fighting to see money voted, devoted to this purpose. If we had done those things, would you have the number of 40 million people out of school? Would you have the level of illiteracy? No, we didn't because we didn't have the civil service. One thing to say this is policy, mm. but you must have the people who are capable of doing it, monitoring what they are doing, you know, and committed to that and leading people to do it. This, this is what we must rediscover. Okay, let me bring you back to this solution issue because now there is a debate saying, look, you, are, you seem to be arguing that what matters is delivering to the common people. Yes. All these basic programs. But what I hear in the country is people are saying, look, it's important how we zone power. It should move from here to there because of equity. Otherwise, the country cannot be sustained. Is it? You see, as far as I'm concerned, there is no section of this country which hasn't got talented people. Mm. Serious, if we all went and we are obliged to have good quality of education, which is also functional and empowering. If we insisted on the priorities in our development, and we all went to the same type of schools, within five, six years of that trajectory, you do not have to rely on simplistic arithmetic quota. So that's one. I believe that with education, which we would have pursued, and also on the back of the success, initial success of the Youth, youth Service Corps, people like me, were insisting on introducing a language program, which we probably would have gone through in 1977. If we had that within five to 10 years, like Switzerland, what would be the language program? I, I still urge. That is, by when you are born like now, wherever you were growing up, you start school there, you learn that language in school, not so. About nine regional languages you learn. But by the time you get to SS1, 
If you are in the north, choose one southern language. You choose Igbo or Yoruba. Which this school, like in the unity schools, must be equipped to teach you. If you are in the south, choose one northern language. So that's your Hold solution on. to national... Probably, no, mm. no. Mm. It's not a solution. Not also. Mm. That will probably be Hausa. Mm. Not Fufu, they not uh, Kataf or whatever mm. it is. Now, the point is that within 10 years, like Switzerland today, whether you are French Swiss, Italian Swiss, or German Swiss, you speak English, international language, and then you speak one or two other languages in common. When you've been to the same schools, type of schools, good quality, you have these languages in common play the same sort of games. And luckily we are one race. And we dress, we are not like, uh, you know, South Africa, white people, black people. Do you think that today we'll be in this problem? We would have exited poverty if we continued the plannings by 1999, maximum. We would have done for the black race what Japan did for the yellow race under the major restriction. We will be talking, when in King's College, I was, later on during the crisis, they said somebody went east. We were asking, is he Igbo? Because nobody knew this thing. And my good friends of my generation who went to Barewa, whether they came from Plateau or from Sokoto or from my degree, you see them bonding so closely. So the point I'm making is that if you insist on this creation of states, all that stuff thing, and tomorrow you've created this street as a state, if these basic things of education, food security, infrastructure, communications and transport, are not there. You will get nowhere. Two, and this is very important, if we continue like now, going into politics as a way to go into Forbes list of rich people, we'll, we'll end up with battle of robbers <laughs> seeking to rule us. For instance, let me tell you, what did Sadwana live in Sokoto? What did Okpara live in Umaya? What did Zik live in Onicha? Even Awolowo Okene, they planted rubber plantations, they told him wouldn't work. You know? So the point is that we must go back to politics, not as a means of self enrichment and this thing. And to make that possible, two things are necessary now. One, like in advanced democracies, limit the amount of money any individual can contribute to a party in one year, as is done in America, in Germany, in all those places. Two, limit the amount of money which a party can spend on, election, on elections. You see? So, if you do that, and the young people, by young, I mean 25 to 67, are able to unite under one person or two maximum, not like before, nine different youth saying they, they have the demography, but they must unite with a vision, 20, 25 year vision, where will Nigeria be? And my vision is that at that period, we should end as first world status, global significance, most important economy in the transformation and modernization of Nigeria. One. So when that is done, and now you go back to what we had, when Jordan was coming to Lagos, Ali Akilu told him, and people of that group, Bukashaye, 
Yusuf Gobiri when they were coming here after the military had turned Nigeria into what it was to become federal palm sex from being northern palm mm -hmm. sex. People were told you are being made palm sex, but you still have a lot to learn. Challenge people, they will rise to the challenge. And they performed. Gobir, Dabchida, Joda, I don't want that. And you asked me a question before. On the eve, on, when they did the coup against Gawan, they wanted to announce immediately nine permanent secretaries, including the head of service, as retired, together with the major generals they announced. It was late Gobir and late Damcheda who said, look here, we have our process. Our head of service is abroad. People like us were taking no leave since the crisis. We were abroad having leave. And he said, you can't do that. It's a pity that the, that process was not continued. But if on the eve of election they couldn't do that, better managed, we wouldn't have had what we had, where 10,000 people without due process were this thing. And we won't be in this position. Because please make it clear to them, under the civil service, we insisted on the three hours conceived in 1969 after due consultations. The 1970-74 plan, the 1975-80 plan have detailed projects after consultations with the various ministries and states, you know, costed and it was monitoring. If that process had continued after 75, planning, subjection to the discipline of planning. In 2010, I was brought in to be the coordinating chairman for the elaboration of Vision 2020. And we agreed to have three implementation plans, 2011, 2010 to 2013, 2011 to 2017, 2018 to 2021. What happened? As soon as Good Luck Jonathan was elected president in 2011, Psycho fans went to him. The next thing you had was Jonathan transformation agenda. So tomorrow you have Abubakar. The next day, okay, okay. <laughs> no continuity. The Indians, because Nehru was a friend of Balewa and helped us, advised us to set up the planning commission. And our first economic advisor was an Indian, succeeded by Dr. Kibo, Payoso Kibo. The Indians, when we were doing the 75, seven, I mean the 2010, 2013, we are completing their 11th five-year plan. And you see where they took India. Let me, let me uh, round up by asking you a personal yes. question. I think you are 87 now? Yes. Uh, and going, uh, to going to 88. And uh, one wonders, as all the super farms, like maybe you are one of the last ones now. What, what do you miss about that period of your life? A bit regret in you know I went back to government yes economic advisor 1999 yes. to 2001 so I was going to ask you so about yeah. it has been regret yes but not without hope I still think God has so blessed Nigeria with resources of all kinds basic minerals precious minerals arable land fossil energy renewable energy big shoreline, and so forth and so on. And brilliant people everywhere. So I'm still full of hope okay. that 
with these two basic things I suggested, and I've suggested salaries, president 35 million, and then from there we go down. Because if you have one million, one and a half a <laughs> month to spend, it's not bad in Nigeria today. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, how, how do you live now at, at 87? How, how's your day like? What can you just give well, us you know, I'm, your typical... I'm very um, active in conservation. I've resigned from all my... Money-making boards? Uh, <laughs> ...companies and all that. I did that in 1999, and I've not gone back. You know, I'm only praying that these young people and I belong to a group of elders across the country, including my late friends, who were consulting before COVID. How we could get only 12 people in each state, you know, across the divides, unite. They have the demography. And as Obama showed in his first coming, if even these millions of Nigerians between 25 and 67, each contributed 5,000 naira. They would outspend the godfathers, mm. one. So there is hope. Mm. But the point is that you must unite against a vision. As I told you earlier, how will we take Nigeria, first world status, and global significance, 2040 or 2050? so that there is continuity and discipline. And this is more important than anything else. And I hope we will remain a secular state. And if God, who is omnipotent, Allah is omnipotent, mm. omniscient, he wanted everybody to speak the same language. We have made it so. He wanted them same religion. We have made it so. Let us not quarrel with God. Mm -hmm. allow the religions to be as they are, but a secular state, and I say, once we have pushed education, basic shelter, basic health, and all that, go back to a merit-driven system, and you will lose nothing, you know? And so I am praying that we'll be able, once again, nobody gave Nigeria more chance when the civil war came. That will be straight. God pulled us back from the brink. I'm hoping he will do the same and enable us to get a group of politicians who are less self-centered, less greedy, less rapacious, less visionless. <laughs> And who will these other qualities of merit, competence, strict integrity, patriotism, so that we may do for Africa what the Japanese did for the yellow race. Thank you, uh, Chief Philip Asedu. I mean you. It's been a very eloquent uh, discussion and presentation by you. Uh, viewers, uh, this is the end of this episode of Reminiscences uh, with Chief uh, Philip Aseodu, who was for many years in government as permanent secretary, as minister, and as economic advisor. Uh, thank you, and uh, until we meet in another edition.